it's not, oh, I don't know, a defense of Islamic slavery. I don't mm. know, you might be, well, that's a weird segue, but that's something that you discovered on the... <laughs> No, no, I was not thinking that. I, I am not surprised in the slightest. You you have to pay for the CDC. Like we have we have the the Canadian uh, Broadcasting Corporation in Canada. So we we have to every Canadian uh, part of every dollar we spend, like two cents of that uh, in taxes, goes towards the CBC. So we we have no choice. But in Britain, you get a choice. That that was that was my understanding. If you want to receive broadcasted TV channels, you have to have a license, but you can stream content like Netflix and YouTube without any license. Okay. And what about uh, Pornhub? I am really starting to despise the fact that I am forced to pay for the BBC. Look at this. BBC Music Magazine columnist. See, this, <laughs> this, this is why I bring this up, because... Typically, uh, typically that's the, that's, that's that's what they talk about. So that's that's why I wanted to know. I just I was I was curious. Did, does does one have to pay for the BBC? That seems to be uh, a frequent talking point uh, amongst the the right uh, in Britain. Insensitive. But Richard Morrison, who studied studied music at Cambridge, blah 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 blah, said that. Well, I I know why he would not care about Black Lives Matter, and I mean that, you know, we we hold these truths to be self evident. You know the the thing. The 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 toe curling, embarrassing, anachronistic farrago of nationalistic songs should be replaced with a more reflective finale, which doesn't provoke offence or ridicule. No, not even slightly. I know you don't like it, but believe it or not, this is this is one of those sort of staple parts of modern British culture, and this is again historical songs that are anachronistic now, but are the connection that this ceremony and the these people have with their own past i know it's hard to understand and i know for the sort of you know cosmopolitan middle class university educated types it's quite difficult to accept that patriotism isn't just bad and it's not just wrong and there is actually something empowering about it and like inclusive about british patriotism i know i was like ooh, how far is it going to take this you know okay i mean you, you could take it to strange new places like, we'd like to keep Britain for the British. And obviously, of course. You know, nationalism is good, everybody. That's difficult to understand. But at least it's not, oh, I don't know, a defense of Islamic slavery? I mm. know you might be, well, that's a weird segue, but that's something that's been discovered <laughs> on the... No, no, I was not thinking that. I, I am not surprised in the slightest. I, I'm not. <laughs> oh well, no, no, this is very uncharacteristic of you, sir. No, that, that's odd, weird. Yeah, no, that's not. That's not normally how these broadcasts go. You know, I've I've seen you before. Hmm. No, this is this is definitely out of character, but uh, interesting. Yeah, no, no, I like to see where he goes with this. Let's let's figure this out. Thing, it's offensive to Black Lives Matter, but the BBC running defense for slavery black slavery in islam a lot of the time but not exclusively obviously uh for islam is that's just fine right so i i don't know if this is a new thing but you don't get credit for undoing the bad thing like it, it's it's not like you don't get a gold star afterwards for ending the thing you started like it, it's not like well good job white people i mean yeah we, we have to credit the whites <laughs> You know, all those noble heroes, every single one of them, all the white people, they got together and they ended slavery. And and what do you think? You think they, d they don't deserve to be celebrated? That's what I celebrate, okay? The heroes. Did slavery. <laughs> Islam treated slaves as human beings as well as property. That's so progressive. That's so progressive. Oh, freeing slaves was made a virtuous act. My goodness, freeing slaves was never a virtuous act before or afterwards, and outside of Islam, was it BBC? What on earth? Like, why are you running defense for the fact that Islam has slavery baked into it? Muhammad was a slave owner. There's a statue of Muhammad in, uh, was it the, is it the Library of Congress? Or what, one, of the, one of the famous American halls of government has a statue of Muhammad, as well as other historical lawmakers. Um, is, is that statue, I mean, A, that's offensive to Islam anyway, but B, the man owned slaves and said that black people look like raisins. So does that get torn down or are we... Wow. Wow. He knows a lot of details about uh, Islamic slavery. Uniquely. I mean, his idea of uh, American slavery, of chattel slavery, of course, you know, the Atlantic slave trade, seems to be that, that white people ended it, and, and so 
good job. I'm going to the fact that um, what is it? It's uh, the, the the slaves came from Africa, and a lot of them were enslaved and castrated. But I mean, that is unbelievably brutal. But there's nothing to see here, is there? This is this is good. I mean, slaves could achieve status. Oh, what's this? He wasn't telling the truth. That's odd. Oh, well, that's a weird segue. A statue of Muhammad on a New York courthouse taken down years ago. It would have given great offense had anyone known it was there. For the first half of the 20th century, an eight-foot-tall marble statue of the Prophet Muhammad overlooked Madison Square Park from the rooftop of Appalachian Division Courthouse at Madison Avenue at 25th Street. Sixty years ago, the statue was quietly removed in an episode that now looks, in light of recent events in Paris, like a model of tact, restraint, and diplomacy. What inspired the sensibilities of the Muslim passers by 1902 to 1955 was that Muhammad, by the Mexican sculptor Charles Albert Lopez, was amongst nine other lawgivers, including Confucius and Moses. And after New York's polluted air had finished with the sugary stone, ooh, sugary stone, trying to figure out whom, from the street level, three very tall stories below the courthouse rooftop, would have been a fool's game. Interesting. So you weren't even able to identify it. Well... I mean, that's a weird segue, isn't it? It's, it's strange. It's odd. It's, it's hard to place, you know. But these leftists, every single one of them, they, they care so much about Christian slavery. This, this is good slavery. Thanks, BBC. <laughs> Country when slavery cringe. Not good. But, you know, Islamic slavery is very progressive. Gotcha. Right, and this is this the, the the wokeness runs all the way through the BBC, and it has done for years. This is from 2018, where they had a trainee role that just said no whites, basically. <laughs> In the criteria for the job of BBC Newsbeat, it states the traineeship is only open to candidates from a black, Asian, or non-white ethnic minority background. <laughs> I mean, that I'm pretty. I would have thought that would be illegal in this country. I honestly. I honestly would have thought that would have been a legal thing, but apparently it's not. Apparently it's fine. And when ch challenged on it, the BBC is like, well, we need this. Otherwise, we're never going to hire non-white people. And it's like, well, why is that? I guess it's something to do with your own bias. And it's interesting because of their own diversity thing. They say equality of opportunity is at the heart of our recruitment process. You'll be judged on your suitability for the job and nothing else. I don't even know where it stops. But today, the BBC came out and said, oh, you're, all our staff should use trans-friendly pronouns. So they should make sure, just like on Twitter where they put it in their bios, they should have at the end of all their emails, you know, just to make sure that nobody accidentally misgenders someone. And what's really interesting about this, right, out of 22,000 employees, the BBC has apparently more than 400 employees that self-identify as transgender, according to their own internal surveys. That makes about 2% of the total population, which makes wow. them massively overrepresented. It's going to carry on it's going to get more and more woke because mm -hmm. nothing satisfies the transgender activists. I mean, the same day, the BBC is institutionally transphobic, the BBC is institutionally transphobic, blah, blah, blah. What are you talking about? What institutional transphobia can there be when they're advising, it's just advice at the moment, advising all their staff to use trans-friendly pronouns? Oh, so problem solved, everyone. I, I, I don't understand what he's taking umbrage right now, then. Are you upset at the end of the day that the BBC is not doing enough, or, or have they gone too far? Or is it both, simultaneously? The BBC anti-male, anti-white, anti-straight, like, demonstrably against all of these things, but not just all of these things. These are, these are sort of like... Uh, like, bits on a totem pole that need to be knocked off, right? We got rid of the white males, now it's the white women. Well, who's next? Well, I've heard that black men are the white men of black people. Before. <laughs> Wait. Oh, we gotta listen to that one again. <laughs> women. Well, who's next? Well, I've heard that black men are the white men of black people. Before, so I imagine that that means that black men are higher on the totem pole than black women. So I imagine they're the next to go, aren't they? It's absolutely unreal. <laughs> Wow. So black is the new black, eh? Is, is that it? Yeah. Black is the new black, according to Sargon. Neat. Well, I'm learning things right now. I just, well, no, no one's trying to take anything away, by the way. No, no one is like, oh, no. Yeah. First they came for the cis men and I said nothing. And then they came for the white men and still I said nothing. And then and shortly, shortly thereafter, oh, they came for the straight men. Yes. Those who love the titty. And yet I said nothing. 
uh, no, y- y'all are fine. Uh, it's just other people are like, hey, by the way, uh, we just want some rights to... Valley Labor Report is a co-op style limited liability partnership. Our goal is to educate the audience about the power they can have through solidarity and collective direct action and counteract some of the propaganda they are fed 24-7 right at its source. Check them out at youtube.com slash channel slash UCL. Well, just, you know, go to patreon.com slash the Valley Labor Report. If the boss left tomorrow, the company would be fine. If all the workers left tomorrow, the company would be in ruins. And yet, Kroger's CEO is getting a 20% pay raise while they cut the hazard pay program. Elon Musk got a $700 million bonus while he carries out layoffs and pay cuts. Brothers and sisters, we got to organize. To our monarch, Thomas Bow, you are the light that guides our path. To our lords, I'm Rav, Steven, Nine Tails Cosmic Fox, and Hans Josephine, we bow meekly for your pleasure. To our knights of the round table, Josh Mickelson, Dylan Byte, Alexander Thaler, Zach Christensen, Todd Buckingham, Todd Lajeunesse, Clement Chutscott, Sky Bear Games, Moss Beast, Political Puppy, Alan R., Andres Chitoro, Good Poon hates cops, that's solid poon then, we salute you. And to all our merchants and farmers, we have our undying loyalty and love.